Hey everybody, uh, we'll get started in just one second. We're just waiting for Olympia to join us. And there she is. All right, let's see. Well, Olympia, it looks like you'll have to follow us or allow me to follow you or similar. Hey folks, yeah, just one second. Or, Olympia, you may have to go off private for like an hour. Um, we'll see. Hello, folks. We are just working out the joining process. We'll get started in a minute. How's everybody doing today? Hi, Ankita. Olympia, it still says you are unable to join. I don't know if uh, you're going to need to... Do you follow us? How does this work? Does anybody know what it takes for somebody to join the live stream? Do you have to be like mutual followers? Hey, Rebecca. Do you know this? You're a social media guru kind of person. How do, what are the requirements for somebody to join a live stream? Hmm. That is so weird. It still says you are unable to join. Yeah, I agree. Why? Uh, it. Let me see if it's because you have a private account. Let's see. But I think one of our last guests had a private account and it worked. Yeah, that's really weird. It says, okay, so you say they can join as long as they're watching this, but it still says unable to join. Hmm. Sorry y'all are having to watch us troubleshoot in live time. If anybody is a Insta expert and knows why it might be. Oh, she has to send a request to join? Okay, yeah. I'm looking at the send invites list and it just says she is unable to join. Let's see. Actually, Olympia, are you on PC? You've got to be on your phone for this to work. <laughs> yeah, thank you for frantically Googling, Rebecca. This is our only our second Instagram live, so we're still kind of working out the bugs. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, everybody. I'm also frantically Googling right now. Hmm. Yeah, if anybody else here is an expert in how to let someone, oh, I think it's working. I think we might be working. Yeah. Yes. It's good. Momentarily, we should have Olympia with us. Hi. Hey. Sorry, I didn't know it would work just from the mobile. So I was from my computer. When you said that, I was like, ah, figure it out. Uh -huh. Perfect. Um, but I need to charge my phone because I thought okay. like, we wouldn't use that. So that is important. Um, just a second because I need to find, um, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Coming. <laughs> Hey, yeah, we did it. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Thank you for your help. Thanks for everyone's frantic Googling. Has anybody else here done a lot of Instagram lives? Is this something y'all have expertise in? Um. This is, yeah, this is like my second one, and I think maybe it's Olympia's first one. So okay, we're going to get there. We're going to figure this out. Okay. Um, let's do it like this. I'm just changing. Okay. I keep my phone like this and see how it goes. Um, Perfect. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just... No, no. We, we made it work. This is I'm like. Try, no, I'm trying like to, to just put the phone somewhere. So I don't have to hold it all the time. Oh, yeah. 
I, I think I'm going to get one of those like phone holder things for these Instagram lives. I've got it like rigged up against a stack of books right now. I'm like, that, that works well enough. I'm just like easily moving up all the sofa, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> whatever works. Like, yeah, live for my first live on Instagram. <laughs> this is an auspicious start. This is good. It's like it's authentic. It's real. Yes. <laughs> Super real. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, fine. Yay, all right. It goes. <laughs> We're doing it. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. This is uh, our second installment of Language Champions Live, a series of conversations with language champions from around the world working in language revitalization. And so uh, I will briefly introduce our guest today. This is Maria Olympia Squilacci. She is a Greco language champion and researcher uh, currently at the University of Naples. And uh, maybe Maria or Olympia, which name do you prefer for the audience? Olympia. Olympia. <laughs> uh, Maria is just to distinguish me from my other two cousins. Her name's Olympia as well. <laughs> I was the little one, so, you know, sudden easily. <laughs> you gotta get your grandmother's name. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have other first names plus Olympia? No, 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 no. It was just the last one then. Same surname, same name, same village. So my parents were like, let's put a Maria in front. Just <laughs> I'll call you Olympia because you're the only one here. So we won't get mixed up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, would you like to introduce yourself a little further? Tell us a bit yeah. about kind of your background, what you're working on? Yeah, so as you said, yeah, I'm, I hold a postdoc position at the University of Naples and I work on Greco, uh, which is a Greek variety spoken in Southern Calabria in Italy. Uh, and actually I had the opportunity, thanks to a project um, run by the Smithsonian uh, two years ago, to work also on Greco a little bit, um, which is the other Greek variety that is spoken in Puglia, in Salento, in Italy. Uh, thanks to my colleague Manuela Pellegrino, she's an expert, an anthropologist, an expert of, of that region. And uh, so I could compare the two, um, the two communities. Um, so these are two um, Greek-speaking minorities, historical Greek-speaking minorities in Italy, because obviously there are other pockets where Greek is spoken, uh, but this is different, like migrants which have um, come recently, more recently. And um, I've been, yeah, so I've been working on Greco, uh, because it's uh, it's my language. It's the language my dad has always um, spoken to me uh, since I was born. And uh, I'm actually, um, I was telling Anna, I'm a father tongue speaker because my mom, she's Sicilian, so she doesn't speak any Greco. Uh, my dad instead, he learned Greco um, from his grandparents who were living uh, with them in the same house. Um, they were from Rokudi actually from Horio of Rohudi, which is um, a tiny village. Um, today it's a ghost town, actually. No one lives there anymore uh, because the population, like um, everyone, was forced to abandon the village uh, back in the 70s because of a huge landslide. And um, the two villages remained abandoned and the, the whole population was scattered all around mm -hmm. Italy and then sent back to Calabria. But the new Rohudi was actually built approximately... 18 years after the landslide. So, you know, it was like a big, it, it had an, a big impact also on language abandonment, in fact, uh, because of the community, of the disaggregation of the community. So my grandparents, my great grandparents <laughs> were from Corio of Rohudi. They moved to Baba Marina, where then my, my dad was born. And um, something he always says, it's like, I was waiting to become an adult to speak that, their language. It's like, when it's my time to speak their language, like everyone is speaking it. Um, so then um, he decided to, to learn it. Um, already when he was a kid, he started asking his grandparents to speak to him in the language. And then when we were born, he just started speaking it to us. It wasn't like, that's something he always says, it wasn't a decision. It was something that came out, like it mm. just happened and, and kept speaking it. So it is my language and, um, and then I decided to work on it as well. So I became a researcher, I started uh, working on the language and um, with a community on, on the revitalization. Uh, so this is approximately. <laughs> a summary of who I am, where I come from. 
That's awesome. It sounds like, so being a language activist runs in the family. Your dad took up this mantle at a very young age, sounds like. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, he, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm not the activist. I'm the daughter of the activist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. Like, when I feel upset, when I feel tired, when I was, then I like turn and think, gosh, there are people like my dad have been engaging with the language with language activists for 50 years now mm. and and they keep doing this you know <laughs> they keep that enthusiasm and working for the language and it's it's impressive uh and then at some point like so my dad he's actually a pediatrician and mm. um he decided he, he has never forced us to speak greco uh he has always like left us free to speak the language we wanted because he is convinced that kids choose their language like and in every stage of their life they choose one language or the other or whatever language they want to speak um so we have lots of anecdotes when we were called mixing when we were kids uh these sorts of things and then actually we uh, we started speaking italian predominantly so he would keep speaking greco all the time i never heard my my dad like using an italian word unless it was a borrowing but <laughs> otherwise like no italian words um and we were like mixing using it in a crypto addict way with my sisters you know like going shopping these sorts of things and i'm gonna stop then, you there what does that word mean for our audience who are not linguists <laughs> oh like um, <laughs> you know when you have a dress that doesn't really fit you or cost too much you use another language so that the shopper doesn't understand you <laughs> <laughs> this is crypto <laughs> like that should sound familiar to a lot of folks <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um, yeah so this is what we would also we used to use greco um like <laughs> to exchange favors like with my dad you know we will speak Greco <laughs> six months and then you buy us a mobile phone <laughs> <laughs> that is a great way to encourage language thing, use yeah. in the home like, in the end we wouldn't get what we were promised but <laughs> it was a good <laughs> way to... <laughs> you know, he didn't um, follow through yeah <laughs> you spoke Greco yeah. just for the pleasure of it oh no <laughs> yes um but then when I was 18, I decided to study languages. I decided to study standard modern Greek because I really wanted to understand the differences between Greco and standard modern Greek. Also because there is a huge academic discussion. This is what I found out after as a researcher <laughs> on the influence of standard modern Greek, you know, more or less puristic attitudes and, and these sorts of things. But at first, I was like very much interested in that. And so I moved to Naples to, to, to study and... Uh, it was actually a very, a very peculiar, like a very particular moment for my family. We went through a very like a terrible thing. And uh, I was also like, it was my first time like living outside. It wasn't just a trip. It was like one year outside um, of, of home for the first time. And um, I remember one night I woke up, I, I called my dad and I was like, from today on, I will only speak Greco to you. It was like, Greco became my connection to my family like mm. I, I felt I was I just missed them so much I, I didn't even hear my language around I couldn't joke in like in Greco or with my sisters with my dad so I was like I really need to speak this language and and I didn't think about revitalizing or anything else I just thought about something that could connect just me and them mm. and that was the language so that's what then when I started um, like the whole thing the, the whole path which brings me here today <laughs> oh that's beautiful so, yeah. so language was like a way to combat homesickness yeah, yeah. oh that's fantastic it was a way to feel like you know to, to feel my family closer to me um yeah it was really that connection that thing yeah oh um, that, oh, that's gonna make me tear up a little that's beautiful <laughs> Yeah, no, but um, yeah. that's the story. And then, yeah, then I decided also to, to, you know, I started with my BA thesis on Greco and then up to the PhD. Uh, um, but that's a different story because when I was like, when I was doing my BA, I remember I said, I really want to become like Rolfs. And Rolfs, it's like the biggest, greatest linguist for Greco together with another one, at least like, you know, they're the icons. Mm. Um so that was my goal. 
Uh, and then, in fact, I started carrying out research and I realized I wasn't interested in that at all. <laughs> Even if I did a PhD, but, but during my PhD, everyone was like, it looks like you're doing completely different things. I was very much interested in revitalization. I was very much interested in, t like, not even revitalization, doing something, like, that would make me and the older people I was with happy. Mm. Um, so it was, like, all my story with Greco is very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> but because we are talking about a language which has very, very few speakers, like, we don't have numbers, but we are talking about a few hundreds and they're all very old like all like over 80s so it is a very peculiar situation and um like there are very few younger young people who speak mm -hmm. the language so i was like i i really need to do something that can help um can help me have friends in a couple of years with whom I can speak the language. So mm -hmm. this, was, this was my idea. And this is how then now the Doma di Greco was born, which is this summer school we set up a couple of years ago. Um, with the idea of, you know, the target was people of my age mm -hmm. who could find an interest um, by meeting these old, old people who were speaking a very weird language in Italy. Um, you know, like many of their grandchildren don't even know that their grandparents speak the language. Oh. Um, so it's, um, I really wanted to, I, I wanted to shake the interest, to shake like the community saying, look, we still have them, they're still here, we can still do something. Hmm. Um, so and, even your, and, yeah. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> well, it sounds like even your dad is a little bit unusual as, as somebody sort of who's not a grandparent who can still speak, right? Yes. Like, so up to the generation of my dad, you can still find people speaking the language and they mostly are people who let the language from their grandparents because mm. my dad's generation is the first generation to whom Greco was not passed down. Mm. Um, so their, their parents decided not to speak the language or their, grandpa their grandparents to their parents, so their second generation. Uh, but then they were the one who started the language education movement, the very first one. So they, because they, they the, the, the legend goes, <laughs> when you ask like in the community, there is this legend, <laughs> everyone knows this story. Uh, there was this group of young people who used to go to Reggio Calabria to the main city, like to, to, to the high school there. And then one teacher found out that they were very good at translating uh, Greek, like ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. And he found out that they were speaking Greco, or at least they had some knowledge of Greco. So he gathered these, these young people. He's called Domenico Minuto, and he's still alive, and he's like uh, one of the most respected person in, in our community, uh, because really he dedicated the language to the people. Um, the, the language, sorry, it did get his life to, to the people. And um, he gathered them around him like he would invite them at, at his place and, and trying to make them understand that they had to be proud. They had not to be ashamed because it was a shame to speak Greco like back in the 50s and 60s, especially Reggio Calabria, which was the main city. So people were like, oh, you come from the mountains, you speak this very stupid language, you are stupid, you are an ignorant. These type of, of stereotypes we all know, we are all familiar with, unfortunately. Um, and instead, they had this teacher, you know, from a high school saying it is a treasure what you have and you have to preserve that. So they returned back home to their mountain like villages in the Aspromonte trying to convince their, their parents and grandparents together with their school teachers to speak the language so mm. this is the generation so these are people like and this is my my dad's age these are people like some of them even know them like like they, they used to, to speak them at home um, or at least they started during those years like they were 15 14 started like um, engaging with the language and mm -hmm. and that's where so we have a date for the language organization movement we know when it started we know how it started like it, it is very precise um, and 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 it's a proud for the community because immediately the the very like uh, for the Smithsonian, this is what I did. Like I, I interviewed people precisely on these issues. Um, and what I realized it was that it was a movement which was felt to be of 
everyone's moment. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was everyone's moment. It was a community moment. It's true, it started from this small group, but it immediately spread. Like, they, they had a great support. Um, obviously, not, not, a, not, a, not, not immediately, because especially all the people were like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And, you know, um, they found these sort of obstacles. And um, they, they, like many people told me, either they were looking for our second goal, like, what is your second? Why are you doing this? Like, what are you gaining out of it? You know, um, or they simply discouraged them because they wanted for them like a better future. Mm-hmm. And a better future didn't include speaking Greco. Speaking Greco meant keep, living in those villages like completely outside of you know still today there are no roads to go to those villages to many of these villages or are completely destroyed Mm -hmm. they're like in very bad conditions Uh, no infrastructures electric lights are right in the 70s running Mm -hmm. water so you know like very very difficult conditions and their parents wanted them to leave these places Mm -hmm. and grego meant keep being there keep being a farmer keep being um, a shepherd and not having a better future. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they really wanted them to, to speak Italian, the local Romance dialects, and, and leave. Like, mm-hmm. we, we come from a land, from a place. Everyone in Calabria, the mantra of our region is just learn a language and leave. Mm-hmm. Leave because there is nothing here. And it's very much still the case today. Mm-hmm. So this was the condition, this was like the, uh, this was the situation when they started uh, the, the whole revitalization movement. And um, so these people, they, they have like a, a good knowledge of the language. Uh, but yeah, after like this generation, then it's very, very difficult to find um, mm. people who are actually fluent in the language. And um, yeah, wow. that's uh, <laughs> well, I was, I was going to ask sort of what's the context of the endangerment of Greco? Why are there so few speakers just in the older generation now? And it sounds like a really familiar story to a lot of folks around the world of yeah, sort exactly. of extreme stigma of ruralness. You got to go to the big city, learn the majority language, exactly. get a good job and make money. Exactly. This hey. is exactly it. This is exactly yeah. it. And in addition to this, and something which is very common also to very many minority, minority minoritized communities, it's environmental disasters. Mm-hmm. So the landslides definitely gave like, you know, the final blow because mm-hmm. the, the community was completely disaggregated. They were scattered like in Italy, sent to the north of Italy, central Italy uh, for months. And then they were told to go back to Calabria. They were assigned houses, which were like, terrible terrible conditions um in different cities so um, something that i always say greco didn't have any economic value already because it was a language that would give you a job and with this disaggregation it also lost its social value Mm -hmm. because it wasn't the language of your neighborhood anymore and if you miss this, like if you, if you lose this as well, then you're just alone with your family in a different environment. Why, why do you have to speak this language? And especially if then you're even stigmatized um, against. Mm-hmm. So it was something that, that really influenced uh, language abandonment. Mm-hmm. And I was reading documents from the, the journal that the first activists uh, released during the first years of, of activism in, in the 70s. And something they were fighting for when the landslides up, um, happened was to keep the community united. So they were aware of this, of this thing. And they were asking, send us to Milan, whatever you want, like on the other, t- on the other side of Italy, but keep the community together keep people mm. together because otherwise the language will be lost um and probably it like definitely not probably for sure very many factors contributed but this was one of the, of the main ones mm. as well. and so there were people lobbying to keep the community together not obviously just for the reasons of it's great to have your friends and neighbors nearby but for the language too like, was yeah, there exactly. A yeah, for the language. Yeah. yeah, no, the language wasn't wasn't taken into consideration at all in these mm-hmm. decisions. It wasn't something that was considered like by politicians, or it was just like something that activists would 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 fight for, mm-hmm. um, but wasn't wasn't part of the of the political um, program. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Even at that point, there were people who saw value in Greco, even, you know, yeah. knowing that there wasn't economic value, but they saw another value in the language. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Exactly, yeah. 
this is this is yeah this is when it started like then it it went different in different ways <laughs> because then the question is why if it started like in such a great way why we don't have so many new speakers today this is the biggest question to answer um but at first like they really had like if you look at their programs but even from the interviews like of people you really think they had like the best realization program in mind like they really mm. had great ideas and um tried to implement lots of innovative things mm. um but 50 years are long and today unfortunately we we are yeah we are with a very very few number of speaker yeah but i think the most important part is the revitalization effort is still ongoing there are still people fighting yes. for this right it's it started again that's a success <laughs> we are on the market again you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the revitalization market that's a not a very lucrative market but <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. Oh man. No. Well, it sounds like... market where you usually just lose lose money, lose oh. energy, lose time. But you gain <laughs> too. Lot. Yeah. You get a lot of happiness seriously like. Yeah. So I was <laughs> wondering so like could could you tell us a little bit about what you've gained from working with Greco Revitalization? Obviously probably not millions of dollars, but <laughs> probably a lot of other things. So for you personally, yeah. aside from like the family connection, what does this language bring into your life? It's um it's a tough question to answer. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> uh, it's really a tough question to answer. Um we can come back to it I, if you want. Yeah, yeah, no, I really need to think because it is it is like besides family, but it is family and if it's not family, it's like all the old people which I consider my grandparents. So mm. we go back to family. <laughs> Yeah. And then all these group of new speakers that the that, that started like the Domadi Greco thing a couple of years ago um which are my friends like they mm. they became my friends like my goal was to create a group of friends uh because when you get to these like such small numbers um what you can aim to like what what i am to is was to have a group of friends speaking this language mm -hmm. um at least for the moment then i don't know what will happen but for now um so it very goes to personal connections emo emotions and um and then yeah it it is also a job definitely because i'm actually carrying out research on greco um i'm 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 juggling these two things like activism and research um but it it is definitely not the most important part of it yeah yeah for sure yeah. so you said that that your goals in your language revitalization work were really to focus on young folks to create sort of a circle of friends who could speak together so i'm wondering for the audience who also would love to do something similar but they're not sure what that would look like in practical terms could you talk a little bit about like what the work of greco revitalization has involved for you so for me um it was so we started this domadi greco summer school which is domadi greco means um a greco week mm -hmm. because as i said like most of the people um most of the young people club they are like 18, 18 years old more or less mm -hmm. either to study or to work somewhere else in italy or in europe um and um what what i thought is that if we had just a summer school like of one week where you can concentrate just on the language um during the summer when everyone goes back home at home then we we would probably you know have bigger numbers like mm -hmm. i would say like probably young people would be interested uh you know just one week you know just injection of um, <laughs> language enthusiasm happiness and and this and, and excursions like i had the excursions in the afternoon which were <laughs> something <laughs> to you know to attract um more people and um the first year we had like 60 people enrolled and i think probably <laughs> i don't know 57 were all over 50 and 60 <laughs> and i was like yes <laughs> yes i did it <laughs> um but <laughs> but but fortunately like it was a great addition we really enjoyed ourselves like 
all of them. Uh, and, and, you know, it's uh, the word spread around and more people, more, like younger people arrive um, the second year and then the third year. And then uh, one year there was like, I don't know, seven, eight, I don't remember the team and how many. Uh, they were all young all very interested and and like really fantastic fantastic persons and um and and that's where i said like guys if you want we can take on this challenge and start speaking the language and they were like okay let's do it we were in a bar you know we just got got to go for a coffee for an ice cream and i said guys we should really do this um so what what we did what my idea was was to do something together because they were influencing Greco. Like some of them had some knowledge because I'd studied it before or they knew um, more than Greek, so it was easier. Uh, some others, like they just didn't know anything about Greco. They just had one week, um, one week um, classes. So um, my, my, my focus is always speaking, 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 speaking. So what I thought, we opened a WhatsApp chat to, to talk like every day because also because like the day after we talked then everyone was in some parts of Italy Europe mm. um, going back to university or work so it's like let's 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 have this group on whatsapp and and talk but we all know that whatsapp group is just about good morning and good evening mm -hmm. and good night and it, it dies there so in order to for us like to keep speaking to keep like having also because we didn't know each other we just met for one week again so to, to have something to do, I, we, I, we decided to open a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And this was something that had come out already with another, with two more people who had joined uh, the Doma di Greco in the years before. And we were like, yeah, we should open a Facebook page, but you know, it would die there. Mm -hmm. But then on that year, I also went to Mexico uh, for a summer school there uh, with the Nawa community. And that's where I met uh, Werner, an activist from El Salvador, and they had a fantastic Facebook page. And when I saw their page and the impact that this page could have, that's where I decided, okay, we really should do this. Because this is something that we, so we have, we have a task. So we have something to talk about every day because we have to publish posts, we have to prepare videos, we have, you know, we have lots of things if we want to manage to page like well. Yeah. So this is our reason to talk every day. And we will do this in Greco. And who don't speak, who doesn't speak Greco, they just have to insert as many words as they can in the language. And then the others will correct, will send the whole paradigm if you like would make a mistake. A verb, then the whole paradigm had to be there, or a noun, the whole declaration had to be there. And they wouldn't do this. Like, they had to do this. They had to go mm -hmm. look in the books, in the grammars, and send the paradigm. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how they actually, they learned very, very quickly. And as soon as I realized they had, like, you know, basic knowledge at least, I started forcing a lot to send voice messages. Hmm. Again, because like my aim was again speaking. Like yeah. I didn't care about anything else. I was like just speaking. And and then the page actually got like a very, very good um impact and that that helped because we were all happy, we were all like um super proud of what we were doing mm -hmm. and helped, you know, fueling the, the enthusiasm. Um and then we started also a theatrical project, um, again, because theatres help so much uh, for communication, mm -hmm. helps people, uh, you know, being like becoming more secure of themselves because mm -hmm. you have to, to speak like you're forced to speak, but you have the sentences already. They're made there for you. You don't have to make the effort. You know, the sentence is there. You just have to pronounce it loud in the language. And this is what we did. So we translated um, the Cyclops by Euripides. And, um, but it was like done in a very, very particular way. The, the director was, was really fantastic. And we translated the Cyclops together. Then like the version we, we then used, it was actually mine, but simply because they were like at the first year. So it wasn't uh, the best one. But, but the idea, like we, we translated it together. We had like language classes and theater classes. And, uh, and this also like was crucial for team building, you know, bonding again, um, which was the main aspect to me because again, we were people who didn't know each other. So it was like a, a long process. Um, and then another thing we did was to launch a crowdfunding campaign because I, uh, 
going back to what we said like we all leave Calabria or any place we're usually like um, be, because of, of um, economic reasons like in many places so there is no job in Calabria so you have to leave and if you leave again it's more difficult to, to realize the language like to create that community like we had a sort of virtual community but uh, but there were people in Calabria who were living in Calabria and um, and I was asking them a lot to do a lot of things uh, for the Facebook page or projects and so many things and I thought if they're not if they don't get paid it's gonna happen as it happened back in the 70s they're gonna leave and then like seriously like no one will be there anymore mm -hmm. um so we launched this crowdfunding campaign explaining that it was important it is voluntary work but if it takes the whole day it cannot be voluntary work. Yeah. It is not right. It's simply not correct. Yeah. And I didn't feel like, I, I didn't feel good to know that they were working, you know, all day for the language, but without um, getting paid. So this is why we launched a crowdfunding campaign and we managed to have three language courses, which they run. Like I didn't, like they were already like mm -hmm. super good at teaching the language. So they run the language courses uh, and, and they were paid for that. Uh, so we launched this campaign, which was called, if you speak me, I leave, adopt <laughs> Greco. <laughs> oh. And uh, yeah. And actually part of this campaign was also uh, for anyone with etches or um, I don't know, photographers, for instance, helpers, like anyone who wanted to help us, they could donate their time. Instead mm. of donating money, they could donate their time. So they could come to Calabria and help us do something for the language. Mm. Uh, so yeah, and very many people helped us. And also we started a project with the University of Warsaw, a calling project, and that allowed uh, this group of new speakers to travel to other minoritized communities um, mm. in the US, in Mexico, in, in Poland, in the Netherlands, and um, get to know um, other activists, but also researchers who engage with, who engage with um, language revitalization and help us also, you know, create the outputs, like concrete outputs that can help our projects in, in the community. So, yeah, and like the, yeah, th this was really like, this, it's still ongoing and it's a, it's a great project which supports us a lot. And, um, and especially puts you in contact with other people. Yeah. So something that was very important, it is still very important to me, it's to be like to sometime to meet with other activists from yeah. other places in the world and knowing that we are all going through the same things. We are all thinking like what I'm thinking right now. We are all suffering, we're all crying, we are all tired, we are all, you know, all this, it's okay, it's fine, yeah. it's frustrating. <laughs> but it also has lots of sides um, of very positive uh, results and brings lots of joy and happiness in your life and friendships and um yeah and and, and also you get so many ideas from sharing yeah. you know you're like oh wow so we can do this and adapt to our case obviously like every different cases and um but yeah like when we had this school uh two years ago in calabria and i told um I told the people there, I was like, this is really my breathing space. <laughs> you know, meeting people uh, that are doing what we are doing. And um, it, it is a moment to say, okay, <laughs> yeah. let's breathe together and go through it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. That, that part about learning from other language revitalization movements in different parts of the mm -hmm. world has so many language activists say that, that you get such fresh inspiration from yeah. novel ideas. Like I've, yeah. I've seen a lot of language revitalization programs, but I've seen very little like theater work. And so I'm getting <laughs> ideas just from talking to you. And I'm wondering like the, the Facebook page you mentioned sound incredibly useful. Are there any yes. other kind of tools or techniques that you picked up from communities in other parts of the world that you felt really resonated in the Greco context? Um, um, the, um, yeah, the um, writing uh, pop songs in Greco. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, is, this is something like... 
Oh. Unfortunately, like um, there was a, a girl, Eleonora, who translated like some, actually not translated, but rewrote in Greco some of the most famous pop songs. And then uh, oh. COVID arrived and we didn't have yet the opportunity to actually uh, share these results <laughs> with the world. Um, but yeah, this is something like uh, that we, again, we had thought about it, like Eleonora, Federica, some other girls, like they, they had proposed it, but then we, we didn't do that. We didn't do it. I don't know, we were full of things too, so we didn't do it. <laughs> then we met like uh, some activists from Galicia and, and they did it and we saw the results. So again, like you see the results and you're like, yes, we're gonna do this. And uh, because probably like sometimes like you, you, you get so many ideas, but also so many things to do and, and you won't like, you don't, you, you can't also. Yeah, <laughs> there are only so but many hours. But once you see other people doing it and you see the impact that these things can have, then you, you're really like, uh, you're sort of encouraged to, yeah. to do that, yeah. Oh yeah, and we're getting a comment right now that there was a, an Instagram account for Asoyu. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It looks like a Tlapanek variety. But yeah, Instagram and other forms of social but, media seem also super key in getting yeah, the language we, out there. On, on Instagram, so we have an account Instagram, but it is not as followed as the Facebook one. We haven't put the same um, yet, <laughs> the same yeah. as we would for the Facebook one. And we also tried TikTok, but with not so much success so far. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we need to work in it. Like, so we got to a moment this is also like one of the um, one of the um, side effects let's say of this it's that at some point you start doing so many things that you forget why you're doing this <laughs> so we were no seriously like we were discussing about this couple of so one of my recurrent like thoughts it's why we're doing this where are we going and you know what's bringing this to us and it's it's always there and um, and we we had like um, a chat a couple of days ago, and I was again like, guys, please remind remind me why, <laughs> like what, what what do we want to achieve and these sorts of things. And then I said like, let's stop, like let's not like publish so much again on Facebook because it was becoming too stressful. Mm -hmm. Like at first it was crucial because we, we needed a task, we needed to do something, we need to bond and so on and so forth. Now we are a group. Now we need to get take care of the group. Mm -hmm. So what we decided is to publish like on Facebook if we want, whenever we want. But we have um, like every month we have to meet either once or twice. Like we will start with once a month um, to have just three hours discussion, three, four, two, how many we want just for us. Just mm -hmm. not, not lessons, not classes, not discussions on how to do Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, whatever, just for us to know. Mm -hmm how are we doing how like also because when we do this we always speak greco mm. so in a way our goal is accomplished like uh, it's, yeah. it's achieved like yeah. the, the idea is to speak greco not to have like an audience not to have eight thousand followers like it's great we have eight thousand followers so we're super Ooh. happy with that but we need to stop like it's okay they're there we uh, can you hear me yeah so yeah the connection's yes. fine um it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, probably. <laughs> I can hear and, you. Um, yeah. So th this is the idea. Like uh, we're not doing this for the others. We're doing this for us. Mm -hmm. um, and if it becomes too stressful because we have always to be, you know, because people expect us to publish on Monday a grammar post on Tuesday mm -hmm. uh, a saying or whatever, then no, let's stop and okay. go back to our roots. Like what do we want to do? to speak Greco, then let's do it. And that's it. Yeah, so you have like regular meetings that kind of give the language some breathing space. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. to be used in <laughs> yes. everyday life. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 Oh, that's gorgeous. But it does sound like you've got a lot on your plate. You're doing research as a postdoc, you're doing language activism, you're traveling all over the place, you're running these social media initiatives. Like, no, 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 I'm not running. Right. I'm not the boss of the social media. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that is another one. <laughs> yeah, no. That's, yeah, yeah. I'm not does. good with social media, as you've seen. Like, <laughs> there is another person, Selena. She's wonderful. <laughs> she's just... <laughs> 
Oh my God. But you're doing so, so much language that it sounds like is getting an entirely new breath of life now. Have you found, like, what's the reaction you get from the elder speakers? Are they, are they really excited to see this renaissance? Yeah. No, they are like, they're my reason to continue. Like, seriously. Mm. <laughs> they are just wonderful. You know, like we have um, every year, we have another breathing space for the language, which is mm. called the, the, the Greco Language Day. And our association has been running this for years now. Uh, because the truth is that you have very few occasions and you, you can speak the language like, when do you speak the language? Never. Just if you go to the house of that person who knows you, who, you know, speaks the language. Otherwise, like if you go out in the street, you will never find, like you can live months there and never meeting someone who speaks the language. So we have this day and it's just for people who speak the language. Like, we're sorry, no one else can join the, the day. It's just for us because we want to speak our language and we need to create these spaces for us to speak the language. Yeah. Now, because of the pandemic, this year we couldn't do it. Um, so we decided to, to hold it online on Zoom. Oh. And they joined it like, you know, 90, 60 years old people on Zoom just for the pleasure of being with us. Or last year during the pandemic, we also decided to prepare a video uh just for us to be you know to feel together to feel closer to each other and they all sent a message so oh. i told them i told their their um, grandchildren uh, guys it's okay like just send them you know saying hi or dancing or whatever they want and they all sit there and sent very long messages <laughs> Awesome. You know, because they're you're very proud of this. And then they mm. ask you, like, I'm an, I'm am I on the internet? Like saying mm. internet in very different ways. <laughs> you know? No, they are super proud. They're very, very, very happy with what we're doing mm. and they really sustain us and it's um it's also like um what I noticed is like that sometimes their children or their grandchildren they have some some knowledge of Greco like but very little one, mm -hmm. like they are not so fluent, um, and uh, they they always say oh no no but they don't speak the language just leave them mm -hmm. and instead they recognize the new speakers as people who speak the language who are entitled mm -hmm. to teach the language like because they hear them they are fluent and this is what they care like they they don't even realize if you get a genitive wrong or get a tense wrong like what they're they're just shocked it's that there is a 30 years old guy who speaks greco like fluently mm -hmm. and they're they're really proud of this like they're really happy yeah oh that's beautiful the, yeah this is something that that makes makes us proud yeah yeah are any of the young folks like currently you know probably some of you have kids do you know if anybody is starting to raise their kids learning greco <laughs> None of us yet. <laughs> so, oops, I keep losing you for some reason. No, I'm here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, none of us has kids yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> you think that's a maybe but, someday? But time will come. Time will like, come. Do you think somebody <laughs> might start raising their kids in Greco, hypothetically? I, I'll, I'll be there checking. Girl, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me know when the first like Greco speaking baby starts growing up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, beautiful. there is one of the guys, uh, Francesco, he has um, uh, ne a niece, and he speaks Greco with niece. <laughs> oh, so actually, we have, yeah, actually, we have one. Oh, my God. Yeah. And do, do the elders ever get to see that little niece speaking Greco? Like, it no, must, no, it must no, feel no. amazing like, to see a kid she's, speaking. Like, she's, she's one year old or mm. two years old yet, yeah. Uh, but she doesn't leave. So um, most of, actually, of the new speakers, they do not originate from the, um, the last Greco-speaking villages. Mm. Yeah. So this is also something very interesting. Mm. Uh, and uh, so they, they visit regularly. It's, it's actually close, like 30 minutes uh, drive zone. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he lives, like, in a different village. Mm. Uh, yeah. But that, that's a dream to work towards for sure. Like, if, if you are dreaming really big, in the best case, what, where do you want to see Greco at in like 20 years? What, does, what is the language situation you want to see? <laughs> this is what makes me feel like it puts me pressure. <laughs> like, it, it is exactly this. It is like, 
you know, we were doing all this and there is lots of expectation. And I realized like every time like one of us releases an interview or, you know, like there are journal articles. When we launched a crowdfunding campaign, there was such a big thing. We went even on national TV for mm. this thing. And um, on social media, again, we have like a big impact on Facebook. And um, I remember one of my videos got like more than... 100,000 uh, shares wow. and then I asked I asked the, uh, the author to remove the video like mm. it's not online like you cannot find it anymore because I I all of a sudden I just became like so scared mm. because like the more people talk about this the more it's like we're changing the world but mm. we're just speaking our language we are happy of doing this We're f because it makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. And it puts lots of pressure on me because I know like I'm one of those who started all this, but I cannot live with the thing that if it fails, it's me. If it goes wrong, it's me. If they speak like not the perfect authentic Greco, mm -hmm. it's me. It's, um, it's just too much. It's too much on me, on my work as activist, as a researcher, as a speaker, as a future mother of kids who mm -hmm. speak Greco. <laughs> Um, it is too much because I, I keep, and this is why, like, and in the group, they, they all make so much fun of me because literally every couple of months I call them like in tears saying, guys, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, what are we doing? Where are we going? And, mm -hmm. and I remember Freedom once said, look, it makes me happy so far. So I keep doing this. I don't care. Like, I really don't care where it's going. Um, because because it, it is like it is lots of pressure and mm -hmm. like unfortunately we had lots of people from academia who supported us but some also who didn't support us yeah. who weren't happy of seeing Greco like still being spoken and really this, yeah <laughs> this this like created like lots of personal problems to me mm -hmm. for instance um, because I really started questioning like if everything like if i was mm. doing right if it was correct if um like and and again what would happen in a couple of years mm. and uh what happens if a researcher comes and interviews them then does it go again <laughs> on me and <laughs> on how i taught them the language because mm. i'm teaching the language it means like if i do a mistake if i make a mistake then this will stay <laughs> Yeah. and like in their speech and it's a lot of responsibility it's really a lot and um yeah well I hope this, is the, is, like, this yeah. is the most difficult part yeah i hope your group is good at giving you pep talks because me i would say even if you're they're making mistakes with the language you taught they're speaking and that's miles above not speaking yeah. you know speaking know, maybe with some little mistakes that's still speaking exactly this is what the community thinks this is what like the oldest speakers thinks like yeah. and that's why they are my driving force yeah because they're just happy like they're just happy that there are you know people in their 30s who speak the language and this year at the domadi greco we were full of young speakers despite the pandemic like we had like such big numbers <laughs> it was great and and they're like some of them kept kept um, learning Greco, like, and I'm running the course online with them uh, this year. And, oops, I don't know, I keep losing you. I don't know if you hear me. Oh, yeah, the video is freezing, and, but I hear you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, uh, yeah, uh, so... <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I just forgot what I was saying, but, but yeah. <laughs> Oh. Well, you understand the pressure I, I live, <laughs> and this well, is why, like, I usually, I like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to have like interviews anymore, or mm. because I feel that every time, like, more people know about our story, and then more people expect me in five years saying, "Yes, we're still here, we're great," mm. but I don't know. The, the yeah. truth is, I don't know. And if they won't speak Greco to their children, it's not my position to tell them to speak Greco to their children and if I will speak Greco to my children they will be free to speak whatever language they want as my dad did with me because like that was the biggest gift he did mm -hmm. and um, I'm proud of having chosen to speak my language when I wanted in the moments I wanted to express what I, how I felt mm -hmm. in the language I preferred and in the toughest moments Greco arrived. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. I don't know. I think I think most folks seeing your work should not put pressure on you to do more. They should just take inspiration for themselves and their own communities. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably the result that seeing this Greco work will have on a lot of folks is not Olympia has to do this by herself. It's, <laughs> hey, I could do something similar for my language. I mean, that, that's the message I'm getting. I'm, I'm not putting it on you. I'm like, <laughs> you. I'm getting Again, ideas. Also, or... It's not just Olympia because there are like, uh, Danilo, who's writing here, Pandalemo, Freedom, Selene, Federica, like <laughs> Francesco, Francesco, Gian Lorenzo, Eleonora, Elisabetta. It's like, it's a group of people. Yeah. It's a group of people. It's, uh, and they're all wonderful, like seriously all wonderful. Uh, so. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for the entire group then. Not just for you, but for the entire group. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's also a way to share the responsibility, you know. Yeah. It's just I'm doing this all <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's really because they deserve it. It's really because they deserve it. Yeah. Oh. Well, <laughs> I, I have taken so much from this conversation with you. Not only, you know, the, the concept of bringing together young folks to really do language revitalization because you want to speak with friends. But, but also just a reminder that when you see language activists out there doing amazing stuff, don't put it all on them. Take that inspiration and run with it in your own community, right? Don't, don't wait for somebody else to do the language work. You can do it too. Yeah. I, would you agree with that message? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome. It's a good way to sum up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today, Olympia. I thank take you, Anna. Thank you. It was awesome to talk with you. And if people are interested in your Greco work, is there a link you would like sure. to refer yeah. to them? Sure. Yeah. It's uh, To Domadi Greco. Probably I can write it myself here. Yeah. I don't know if it works. Yes. Domadi Greco. The Greco week. It, it just takes one week. Then you see what happens. You have a whole revitalization movement. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. The Greco week. The Greco. Yeah. It's there. And take this inspiration. And if you are moved to work for your language like this, you can do it. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Olympia. It was so totally. nice to talk to you. And uh, we'll be in touch. Bye, Anna. Good morning to you and good evening to me. Kalabramata, <laughs> good things. <laughs> if it makes sense in English, I don't know. I like it. I like it. Bye. Bye. Bye.